something uh, derivative of your work springs up here in New York. Thank you. That would be very interesting. Thank you very much, Brian. Diversity. It's not just about minorities anymore. Increasingly, talks and trainings around identity and race include the concept of white as a race and white privilege as an issue. This is now becoming central to discussions of race in America and not just in progressive circles and on college campuses. The white privilege conversation has reached even New York City's upscale prep schools. What exactly is being taught and why? Joining us, Derek Gay, an educational consultant who leads diversity seminars. And to put all this in historical context, New School Professor of History, Natalia Melman Petrozella. She is author of Classroom Wars, Language, Sex, and the Making of Modern Political Culture. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Derek, tell us what you're doing. What I'm doing. So I'm an educational consultant, and I'm currently working with schools on issues of cultural competency, diversity, and inclusion. So give me an example of where you start. Let's say you go into a mostly white high school and you want to give these kids maybe for the first time in their lives um, the opportunity and maybe opportunity is the wrong word and maybe the very scary prospect of talking about themselves as white people. Where do you start? So I start with this whole notion that we all have various forms of identity. So one of the exercises um, that I've designed focuses on thinking about who you are. So I ask, um, I share with the group some data that I've collected over the past 10 years of the same question I've asked independent school students and faculty and staff. When you look at the mirror, who do you see? And what are some of the um, categories that sort of constitute who you are? Certainly race, gender, class, sexual orientation, uh, age, educational background, political affiliations and the like. So I think for a number of years, um, as I mentioned in my TED talk, that this whole diversity uh, framework has very much been an identity. And the identity has served as a proxy for historically marginalized groups and in the framework of race it's been about uh, black people, Latino people, and, and Asian people. So often, particularly in a predominantly white institution, I realize that white students, either A or faculty, have not thought of themselves as a racialized being and come to diversity very much with the mindset that they're here to learn about the other. Mm -hmm. So first is to disabuse them of that notion to sort of make an even playing field that we all have identity and we all have claim and benefit to this conversation. And, and since you're the historian in yeah. the room, this did not happen very much before? No, and so if you think about the kind of first half of the 20th century, really the kind of governing paradigm around issues of diversity was assimilation. And so that's like that old melting pot idea, right? That there's this kind of dominant white Anglo culture which outsiders are slowly melded into, and that's how you rise in society. Then after the civil rights movements of the 1960s, things start to look quite different. And I mean, the negative way that's often characterized is the rise of identity politics. But essentially, if you take with that negative valence, this idea that identity was all of a sudden privileged in many different ways. Both people claiming, be it black power, brown power, their identity as women, um, kind of historically under or marginalized groups, started claiming their identities. Now, the educational outgrowth of that were a lot of the programs, first on college campuses that we're aware of, black studies, women's studies, um, you know, Chicano studies, and that, those have trickled down. Everything but white and exactly, male. Exactly, exactly. Because um, very much the idea was, well, people who have gender are women, right? People who have race are black, brown, um, outside, outsiders, right? So it took a long time for kind of whiteness to be interrogated as a social construct, not until really the 1980s or 90s, and that's on college campuses. And now it's moving even to high school. Absolutely. And interrogated is an interesting yeah. word uh, because, Derek, if most people come out of identity studies, that is to say if black people, brown people, yellow, red people, whatever you want to call them, come out of identity studies and women with feeling better th about themselves than they did before, mm -hmm. um, are whites supposed to come out of this feeling worse about themselves than they did before? And this, as you can imagine, is often the pushback we hear. And uh, we're speaking early about this whole notion of in the United States, um, often we equate uh, sort of white power or discussions around whiteness with white supremacy, right? Because whiteness has been normalized, and as we know, whiteness was in fact um, sort of conflated with citizenship for, for a number of years. So this whole notion that um, white people can come together 
um, to explore the ways in which their identity has some type of social impact or informs the way they view the world is, 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 is a novelty, first and foremost, but also there's a stigma involved. So often people will say, we have affinity groups, we have affinity groups around race for people of color. What if we were to have an affinity group for white people as well? And the answer is, well, we do have affinity groups for white people, and some of the benefits and outcomes are the same. Um, and so privilege then has to come into it, and how do you deal with privilege? And so privilege I would define as, and first I would distinguish between privilege and privileged, right? Because I think that the word privileged often characterizes, or there are these images of sort of a white, upper class Christian male who's put into this category, and therefore he, he can't be part of this conversation, right? He's, he's the problem. Um, I often in my um, workshops talk about this notion of privilege as being uh, unearned advantage, and we all have different forms of privilege. So again, not to dilute the power of white privilege, but also to, um, to not have a paradigm where if you are of color, you're necessarily oppressed and you have no agency, and if you're white, you're coming from this conversation only with privilege and um, there's, there's, there, those are your, those are your positions, right. and there's, there's no room for. But for a it. as a matter of history, yeah. and sort of on average, uh, it's certainly going to be that, you know, one has come from a more privileged starting point than the other, and that's a fundamental or the fundamental thing uh, to acknowledge, right, and to come to grips with. Acknowledge, and then what do you do with that privilege? Does it paralyze you? Um, to the point where there are feelings of guilt and embarrassment alike, or do I acknowledge this privilege, right, which is very difficult, especially in the American paradigm of meritocracy, that I have what I have only because of the work that I've done. Um, what do I do with this privilege? And I argue that with that privilege, white privilege, male privilege, Christian privilege, other types of privileges, that we should use our voice and agency to foster this this equitable society that, that we all dream about. With, with more experience with this on college campuses, yeah. How has this played out when privilege gets inserted? Does it work? There's, there's a term that I think you, you were telling my producer where, you know, I, I think it's a common term. People, if, if a white person says something, somebody might say to them, check your privilege. Yeah, so check your privilege is a phrase that comes up a lot on many different college campuses. And the idea behind it is that when you make a comment, you should kind of check the different forms of privilege which inform that comment, which is not a bad thing at all. And, some of the, and that, I think, in my particular campus, at my institution, I think we've really done a lot of very good work on this front. My students are incredibly sensitive to these issues and all identify themselves in a sort of intersecting range of different categories and tend to be sensitive. The one kind of negative outcome that I've seen of this and that I work very hard as an educator to kind of mitigate is that some students who do consider themselves privileged in the most traditional forms, economically, racially, can sometimes feel silenced by this. Like that, oh, well, if I come from a place of privilege, I have nothing to add to this conversation. And I've sometimes Or I'm just going to get... Uh, slammed for it. Exactly. Yeah, and I have seen that happen. And what I try really hard to do, because, and you see that, by the way, all over social media. I mean, these are like the central, some of the central conversations within like um, Twitter feminism, et cetera, of the way mm -hmm. that the, this goes on. With the privilege, the privilege of being in a classroom and having that group of people who have to look at each other in the face every day, you know, when they come to class, I try and make it more of a community of inquiry. So make this really concrete. What's yeah. an example of even a conversation that has taken place in one of your classes? Okay, so um, let me think right now. So one time, one student who was a um, young woman who came from a very wealthy part of Beverly Hills, and she, we were talking about bilingual education and the struggles of Chicanos in that area, and she says, well, I'm from LA and she actually had gone to public school for part of her life and she started talking about her experience. A person who identified as Latino said, like, what do you really know, rich white girl? Literally said that out loud in class. And she was like, oh, you know, kind of like the wind was knocked out of her sails, which I absolutely could imagine. Could imagine it, it made sense. So that, to me, I've got to step in and make that a kind of teachable moment. Okay, why did that make you so angry that she says that? Why did? Why do you think he said that? And so we turned it into this conversation where they both kind of acknowledge the real anger that comes from someone yeah. being marginalized and yeah. a history of marginalization and having some rich white girl right. tell you something, but also the unfairness of lashing out at this particular person right. in this particular. 
particular context. And how about a high school example? Can you give us one? A high school example around, um, well, often students will say in focus groups that, um, you know, when we have the diversity talk or diversity lecture or what have you, if they feel that they come from a place of privilege, that they're afraid to engage because they're afraid of perhaps the reaction of not using the right word, right? They don't want to offend. And this is with faculty members as well, which I really appreciate that you facilitate that conversation, mm -hmm. which speaks to the, the, the importance of faculty development mm -hmm. as, as well, which isn't necessarily part of education formation as a teacher to talk about these issues. Yes. But it's easier to disengage than to engage in these conversations. So you have the big elephant in the room of race. You have people who don't necessarily see themselves as racialized beings, as, as individuals. They're reading Twitter feeds. They're learning about Ferguson and, and, and Eric Gardner and the like. But they don't have the vocabulary, and they're afraid of how it might be perceived. And, and is it even getting harder these days? Because I think with fourth wave feminism and other identity things that are going on on campus and maybe in the high schools. People now are talking about microaggressions, which is a new term. So you could say this thing that's such a small amount off from what's politically correct, mm -hmm. um, and you're guilty of a microaggression. So is it getting easier or harder to have these conversations? It can, if you're kind of cynical about this, it's harder to navigate some of this terrain because one can be scared of misstepping. I mean, um, you know, right now we're in a big conversation at our institution about the use of pronouns, right? And the uh, gender pronouns. And who even questioned gender pronouns 10 years ago right. on kind of mainstream college campuses? And so there's this sense of, can I, is there anything I can count on is fixed anymore? And that can be a little bit frustrating and hard to navigate. However, I try and look at it in this long historical sense and think for a long time people must have been were frustrated like oh now women are in the classroom I have to navigate that there was a lot of conversation about that we're gonna have girls in the classroom they'll be so distracting we're gonna have to worry what we say this is the price of really working towards a diverse society last thought real quick same question Microaggressions. Uh, microaggressions, I view as being an outgrowth of sort of the ways in which racism has morphed. So it's no longer often, particularly in independent schools, and we've been desensitized to, you'll rarely hear someone say, I don't like you because you're a racial epithet. Right. But um, we will see the subtle comments, the assumptions and the like. Uh, manifest in a form of microaggression. So the education around microaggressions is providing people with the tools first a to mitigate um, you know these actions mm -hmm. or thoughts what have you before they happen but also to have some tools to navigate what happens. To have mm -hmm. conversations. That's right. Well a little piece of the difficult conversation <laughs> yes. about race and gender and identity that we need to have and have and have and have in this country. Thank you Absolutely. both very much. Thank you. Thank you.